about 15 years ago, uh, on a day like today, um, usually the, the last Sunday before Christmas, or, or sometimes the second last Sunday, the kids uh, would put on a little, a little program. And about 15 years ago, um, I believe it was at night time, um, the kids put on a program and a lot of music, a few, uh, a few vignettes in there. But at the end of the program, uh, I remember that the kids wrote uh, a good part of the play. These kids were about in the 15 to 16 to 17 years old range. And they wrote the play and uh, the, last, the last part of the play they played a song by Chris Rice, and it was called Welcome to This World. And uh, at the end of the song, the manger was, was up front, and uh, one of the kids, I don't remember who, uh, walked up and placed a, a cross uh, across the manger in it. It was, uh, it was quite a moving moment, and uh, it, really, it really touched me that uh, these kids understood uh, the fact that the, the nativity and the cross uh, were all part of the same story. They're not two, two separate stories that, that Jesus was a baby that came down and uh, he, was born, he was born to die. We gather together on Sunday mornings to, uh, to look at the cross. Um, but we're going to be looking at some of the things in the Christmas story, and they're not mutually exclusive things. As we've said, they're, they're interwoven in so many ways. The, the cross is foreshadowed, um, not only in the Old Testament. If you go through all the, the Old Testament books, you'll see the cross being foreshadowed in there, uh, some um, in very bright and, and obvious ways, and some a, a little bit more obtuse, but the cross is there in, in pretty much every book of the Old Testament, and it's the same when we get to the Gospels and, uh, and in, the, in the Nativity story. Um, the word foreshadowing, uh, that's, a, that's a term that I learned uh, when I hit high school. It means uh, something that is a warning or an, or an indication of a future event, and where we learned about that um, when you hit high school, you uh, in English class you have to you have to read a, a Shakespeare play uh, every year of high school. I'm not sure if they're still doing that. I suspect they they are. Um, and every year the exam would ask the same question: give us two examples of foreshadowing in uh, Julius Caesar, or Romeo and Juliet. Julius Caesar was a, a book we did in grade ten, and the start of that. The soothsayer comes out, and uh, the first thing he says, beware the Ides of March, and you know uh, that something in the future is going to happen uh, on the Ides of March. Somebody's, somebody's going to die, and of course, uh, that's what happens to, to Caesar. And in Romeo and Juliet, the narrator comes out in the first scene and says, we have here two star-crossed lovers, so you know um, that this story is not uh, going to end well. Uh, because it's foreshadowed in the opening scene. And in the nativity story, there's, there's plenty of uh, foreshadowing, uh, even in the beautiful story of, uh, of Jesus coming down and uh, being born in the stable. The first example I'd like to give, um, I don't think it, it was certainly, it wasn't random or an accident that the shepherds were the first to learn of uh, the coming of the Savior uh, when the angels uh, came to them. They were the first worshipers uh, outside, of, uh, outside of Joseph and Mary. Jesus, uh, again, in a, a paradoxical way, he was uh, John. In John, cha <clears throat> sorry, John chapter 1, uh, John the Baptist proclaims uh, Jesus uh, as he's opening his ministry and he's being baptized, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the, the sin of the world. That was a foreshadowing of, of what was going to, to come, calling him the Lamb of God. 
And then Jesus himself, uh, showing his paradoxical nature, he's not only that lamb uh, that's going to uh, die for the sins of the world, he's also the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, he says, I'm the good shepherd. So not only is he the, the lamb, uh, he's also the shepherd. And you go forward in the story after the birth, uh, eight days into, into Jesus being on this earth, he's taken to the temple, Joseph and Mary take him to the temple. And uh, there they meet an old man uh, by the name of Simeon. Uh, quite often Simeon gets, uh, the, gets ignored at Christmas time. It's a wonderful story in Luke chapter 2. And uh, Simeon has been promised uh, that he, he will stay uh, on this earth until um, he gets to hold the, the Savior in his arms. And it's a beautiful story. And Simeon sings a song, a, a beautiful song. Uh, when he's holding Jesus. Uh, but after the song, he says something very interesting to Mary. He says, uh, he says that a sword will pierce your soul. Very, uh, very odd thing to say to, uh, to, the mo- to a mother of a newborn. And it says Mary went and, and she thought about these things. I don't think she had uh, any real idea what, what Simeon was talking about, but it was foreshadowing the death um, of this this beautiful baby uh, who came uh, to redeem his people. Um, they thought that he was going to redeem them in one way, but uh, God had different plans. He was going to redeem them at the cross, and that that's definitely what Simeon is referring to, and it's an obvious foreshadowing of, of Jesus' death on the cross. And then later on in, in Math, Matthew chapter 2, we read about the the wise men, uh, the magi coming. Uh, if you have a nativity scene uh, at home, it probably has the uh, wise men in there. You, you see it all the time. You, you see it in some uh, Christmas carols and Christmas songs. Um, the biblical narrative, uh, the wise men actually came after, uh, after the birth. It doesn't say how long, but they were back in a house, so it was sometime in the future when Mary and Joseph and the baby were in a house. The wise men came along. Uh, tradition says three. Uh, maybe that's because they had three gifts. Uh, could have been more. It doesn't really give a number. But the wise men bring three gifts. And the gifts are gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is a gift uh, fit for a king. Uh, so the newborn king was born. So that was a very fitting gift. Frankincense is a, is a gift, is a, something associated with the deity. So they understood that this baby that was born was, was not only going to be the king, but he was, he was God himself. And uh, they understood that in their gift. But their third gift was myrrh. And that's, uh, that's an ointment that is used at burial time. A uh, very, very odd gift to bring uh, to a baby, and I'm sure uh, Mary and Joseph, again, um, they could understand the first two gifts, but um, were paused to uh, ponder what that third gift was all about. And it was a foreshadowing of that death of this baby um, who came to be the savior of the world, um, and not by a means that many had hoped and expected. Um, but he was going to be the savior of the world by dying on that cross and it foreshadowed his death uh, 33 years down the road. And, uh, and that's what we're here to remember this morning. We're here not only to, to remember his birth, um, but more, more importantly, uh, when, we, when we break bread and drink the wine, we're, we're remembering his death, um, that sacrificial death, that paradoxical death that the the creator of all the universe would come to die so that we would be brought back to him, and that's what we're here to remember this morning. Uh, The Lord's Servant. The Gospel of Luke records the story of Jesus' birth from the perspective of Mary. Mary lived in Nazareth, a town in Galilee which was inhabited by a people who were often regarded with the contempt by most of the more religious Jews. God sends the 
angel Gabriel to speak to Mary, a young virgin who was pledged to be married to Joseph, who, like Mary, is a descendant of the great King David, the greatest of all Israel's kings. Mary was understandably frightened, but Gabriel calms her fears by saying, Fear not, Mary. You will be with the child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. When Mary wonders aloud how this can be, Gabriel then explains the great miracle of the virgin birth. While Mary was no doubt bewildered and somewhat overwhelmed by all that was happening, she answered Gabriel by saying, May it be to me as you have said. Her song recorded in Luke chapter 1 is a beautiful song of obedience that has come to be known as the Magnificat. Joseph saw no angels as Mary did. He was an honorable and just man, but was understandably confused about all that was happening. In Matthew 1, we read that Joseph was considering putting Mary away quietly, but then an angel of the Lord revealed God's plan to him in a dream. Joseph no doubt thought of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, written centuries earlier and talking about how a virgin will conceive and be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. We know almost nothing about Joseph apart from his gentleness and willingness to say no to himself for Mary's sake and for God's. Imagine the dilemma of that simple carpenter finding himself cast into the role of father to the son of God. While neither Mary nor Joseph had a full understanding of God's ultimate plan of redemption, ultimately they were willing to follow the Lord in obedience and were willing to be the Lord's servants in a dark and troubling time. Thank you. said to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news for good joy that will bring for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord, Luke 2, verse 10, 11. The Shepherds, the Shepherd's Song. When Jesus was born, there were a group of shepherds nearby tending their flocks at night. As the shepherds kept their, their vigil there in the dark, an angel of the Lord appeared. Suddenly the darkness was gone and they were bathed in light. The angel appeared to make the announcement of good news. But first, of course, those familiar and comforting words, fear not. Whenever God acts in an unexpected manner, we are overwhelmed with fear. In the eyes of Jewish society, these shepherds would be of little worth. In fact, by law, they were even disqualified from, testing, from testifying in court. Nevertheless, they were chosen to be the first to hear the good news. Again, we see that God chooses the, in, the insignificant, the seemingly worthless to be his instruments. 
The heavens could hold back no longer, and like the bursting of a dam, the skies exploded with a multitude of praising angels. Glory to God in the highest. The shepherds found the shepherds found the family in the stable, just as they had been told. The they would have been familiar with the sounds, smells, and life of the stable. They returned to their fields, to their fields, glorifying and praising God. It was only fitting that the first worshippers of the Lamb of God were humble shepherds. One wonders if these simple men ever made the connection, ever made the connection between this lamb and their own lambs, or if they could. Or if they could ever tend sheep again, as if nothing ever happened, the shepherd's song.
if the world looked realistically at the birth of Jesus, they would be puzzled that we should celebrate the birth of a, of a baby who was born to die. The contradictions should be more than the world can take. If people could see, just see Christianity for what it is, a paradox and a mystery, the beginning in that dirty stable is one of the greatest mysteries. The, the plainness and the greatness of Jesus, the grim and the glory, wise men with gold in their hands and shepherds covered in the smell of sheep. A smelly stable on the night he was born, followed by a shining star overhead upon the imminent arrival of the wise men, the birth of a gentle lamb who is a fierce lion. But the world doesn't seem to struggle with these contradictions. They join us in our season of celebration, un unruffled and oftentimes more joyful than we are. The shabbiness, the shabbiness of the setting reminds us of that other shabbiness that Jesus chooses every day to be born, the human heart. A place more fil filthy, than, filthy and cold than any stable. If Christmas means anything to you, it means that then, then it must mean everything. The beginning and the end, it, it is a time of darkness and inexpressible light. The time of joy in finally seeing all of God's promises come true in one person. Celebrate, yes, gather, gather around a cattle trough and celebrate a baby who was born in poverty and rejected of men. Why? Because he is the savior of the world. Cele celebrate the child who is, who is the light and now the darkness is over.